Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to our read-along of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. We are not only talking about this book, but I'm reading it to you, chapter by chapter. And uh, what can today's chapter be but anticlimactic? Really. Because first we had a chapter where, out of the blue, Mr. Darcy proposes to Elizabeth Bennet. And she shoots him down in the most straightforward language imaginable, insultingly straightforward language. And then we had a chapter where he hands her, the next morning, he hands her a letter defending himself, explaining his behavior on the two points she criticized him for when she turned him down. And she reads the letter, and it's thrilling. We get the whole text of the letter in that chapter. And then in the next chapter, she reads the letter and rereads the letter and parses the letter, and it changes her. And those chapters happen one, 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 just like that. Amazing, amazing reading. As thrilling as involving, as take you out of your selfing as the Battle of Borodino in War and Peace. <laughs> so, 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 as one of you put it in the comment section, Jane Austen, we are not worthy. Uh, but what can the next chapter be but anticlimactic? Elizabeth Bennet's visit to Hunsford Parsonage is not over yet. But Darcy's leaving. He's not going to see her again. Obviously, his his offer of marriage is not going to be repeated as far as Elizabeth knows she doesn't have much in the way of attraction for her current host or his patroness so chapter 37 is bound to uh, give us a moment to, to breathe <laughs> so let's see let's see what happens in this chapter uh, the two gentlemen left Rosings the next morning that is Mr. Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam uh, and Mrs. Mr. Collins having been in waiting near the lodges to make them his parting obeisance was able to bring home the pleasing intelligence of their appearing in very good health and as in, in as tolerable spirits as could be expected after the melancholy scene so lately gone through at Rosings. He's he's been waiting outside just to bow to them as they go by. He, he's able to report that they looked fine because they don't stop to talk to him. He is an incredible toady. Uh, to Rosings he then hastened to console Lady Catherine and her daughter and on his return brought back with great satisfaction a message from her ladyship importing that she felt herself so dull as to make her very desirous of having them all to dinner with her. And here we get the usage of dull as, I'm down, I'm deflated, I could really use some company. Which is, if you're wondering what that feels like, just imagine Steve on a Friday. Steve on a Friday afternoon is feeling very dull and would really like a half a dozen of you to come over here for wine and calzones, but you don't. Because you live all over the world. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Elizabeth could not see Lady Catherine without rec recollecting that she had chosen it. Had, that had she chosen it, she might by this time have been presented to her as her future niece. Nor could she think without a smile of what her ladyship's indignation would have been. What would she have said? How would she have behaved? Were the questions with which she amused herself. Little guessing that we are going to learn that exact thing. We're going to learn how Lady Catherine de Bourgh reacts to this once the book gets going. One of the book's greatest scenes, we get her answers to those questions. Uh, their first subject was the diminution of the Rosings' party. I assure you, I feel it exceedingly, said Lady Catherine. I believe nobody feels the loss of friends so much as I do. But I am particularly attached to these two young men and know them to be so much attached to me they were excessively sorry to go, but so they are always. The, cur the dear colonel rallied his spirits tolerably till just at last, but Darcy seemed to feel it most acutely, more, I think, than last year. His attachment to Rosing certainly increases. <laughs> his Lady Catherine sees that Darcy is much more miserable than his cousin. And she just assumes it's, well, he's leaving me. Wouldn't you be miserable? <laughs> we know the reason. For the cloud on his brow. She has no idea. Doesn't guess it at all. Uh, Mr. Collins had a compliment and the illusion to throw in here, which were kindly smiled on by mother and daughter. We don't get it. Jane Austen knows at this point she doesn't need to show us this guy toadying. He has made some fulsome, ridiculous compliment. Lady Catherine observed after dinner that Miss Bennet seemed out of spirits and immediately accounting it for herself by supposing that she did not take like, like to go home again so soon, she added. So in other words... She assumes she sees that Elizabeth Bennet also has a, a cloud on her brow and just assumes, again, the reason is me. <laughs> she doesn't want to leave Rosings so soon. So she says, uh, but if that is the case, you must write to your mother and beg that you may stay a little longer. Mrs. Collins will be very glad of your company, I'm sure. I am much obliged to your ladyship for a kind invitation, replied Elizabeth, 
but it is not in my power to accept it. I must be in town next Saturday. Why, at any rate, you will have been here only six weeks. I expected you to stay two months. I told Mrs. Collins so before you came. There can be no occasion for you going so soon. Mrs. Bennet could certainly spare you another fortnight. But my father cannot. He wrote last week to hurry my return. Oh, your father, of course, may spare you if your mother can. Daughters are never so much consequence to their father. And if you will stay another month complete, it will be in my power to take one of you as far as London, for I am going there early in June for a week. And as Dawson does not object to the barouche box, that's the seat up top there exposed to the elements, there will be a very good room for one of you. Or indeed, if the weather should happen to be cool, I should not have taken you both, as you are neither of you very large. You are all kindness, madam, but I believe we must abide by our original plans. I want to point out here that Lady Catherine de Bourgh is being very nice. She's being very nice. Yes, she's imperious. Who doesn't have an older relative who's like that? She's being imperious and self-centered, but she's also being very nice. She wants these young people around. She's offering, we should at least stay a little bit longer. In fact, if you could stay a whole month longer instead of two weeks longer, I'm already planning to go to London. I'll take you with me. Keeping in mind what Elizabeth said earlier to Colonel Fitzwilliam, that travel is expensive. That's a, a handsome offer to take these two, because it isn't just that she's offering them the ride on their carriage. She's offering to maintain them in London. That's a very handsome offer that's made just for their company. Not to bullet boss, boss them around. They, Elizabeth Bennet and Maria Lucas are not anybody she has any control over. Anyway, anyway, I don't want to let my Lady Catherine fly, uh, a flag fly it's quite so early. Uh, and she seems resigned to this. When Elizabeth tells her, no, I'm afraid I have to decline, she seems resigned. Uh, Mrs. Collins, you must send a servant with them. You know, I always speak my mind, and I cannot bear the idea of two young women traveling post by themselves. It is highly improper. You must contrive to send somebody. I have the greatest dislike in the world of that sort of thing. Two young women should always be properly guarded and attended according to their situation in life. When my niece Georgiana went to Ramsgate last summer, I made a point of her having two men servants go with her. Miss Darcy, the daughter of Mr. Darcy of Pemberley, and Lady Anne could not have appeared with propriety in a different manner. I am excessively attentive to all those things. The reader might be smiling just a bit behind their hand because <laughs> uh, Lady Catherine's prep, her, her uh, attentiveness missed something <laughs> missed the detail about that ramsgate visit <laughs> you, you're supposed to snicker just a little at this if, if jane austen thinks you're paying attention uh, you must send john with the young ladies mrs collins i am glad it occurred to me to mention it for it would be really discreditable to you to let them go alone this is jane saying my uncle has is to send or no uh, it, it, she's saying my uncle is to send a servant for us oh your uncle he keeps a manservant does he I'm very glad you have somebody who thinks of those things. Where, you sh where shall you change horses? Oh, Bromley, of course. If you mention my name at the bell, you'll be well attended to. <laughs> what horror stories must the bell people have to say about her, about Lady Catherine coming through? Oh, my God, how has she terrorized the local inn? Lady Catherine had many other questions of, to ask respecting their journey, and as she did not answer them all herself, the attention was necessary, which Elizabeth believed to be lucky for her or with a mind so occupied she might have forgotten where she was. Reflection must be reserved for solitary hours. Whenever she was alone, she gave way to it as the greatest relief, and not a day went by without a solitary walk in which she might indulge in all the delight of unpleasant recollections. She's torturing herself with these thoughts, but it is still delightful. Uh, Mr. Darcy's letter she was in a fair way of knowing soon by heart. She studied every sentence, and her feelings towards it, writer, were at times widely different. When she remembered the style of his address, she was still full of indignation. But when she considered how unjustly she had condemned and upbraided him, her anger was turned against herself, and his disappointed feelings became the object of compassion. His attachment excited gratitude, his general character respect, but she could not approve him, for, nor could she for a moment repent her refusal or feel the slightest inclination ever to see him again. In her own past behavior, there was a constant source of vexation and regret, and in the unhappy defects of her family, a subject of yet heavier chagrin. They were hopeless of remedy. Her father, contented with laughing at them, would never exert himself to restrain the wild giddiness of his youngest daughters, and her mother, with manners so far from right herself, was entirely insensible of the evil. Elizabeth had frequently united with Jane in an endeavor to check the imprudence of Catherine and Lydia, but while they were supported by their mother's indulgence, what chance could there be of improvement? 
Catherine, weak-spirited, irritable, and completely under Lydia's guidance, had always been affronted by their advice, and Lydia, self-willed and careless, would scarcely give them a hearing. They were ignorant, idle, and vain. While there was an officer in Meryton, they would flirt with him, and while Meryton was within walk of Longbourn, they would be going there forever. This is a little confusing to me. This bit has always confused me a little. Your comments are wonderful on the subject. Your emails are wonderful on the subject. We are talking about this book while we go through it. That is wonderful. That is exactly, not to be, I'm not meaning to be condescending here, but that's exactly how I conducted my classes. The idea was, in my, in my classes, the idea was, all right, for, I want to get rid of your 18 to 25 something arrogance. I have read this book more times than you will ever read it. But that doesn't mean I know everything about it. We are still going to have a conversation and maybe some of your insights are going to change my mind. So maybe you can help me. Because I do not understand why Mrs. Bennett does not correct her two youngest daughters. Yes, we're told that that uh, that her mother, uh, that her manners are so far from right herself. But that doesn't change her hyper-awareness, her antenna awareness of what behaviors will hurt the marriage market, which is all she cares about here. She doesn't know her daughters. She doesn't know Catherine and Lydia as people. All she cares about is getting them well-situated in life. Why is it that those instincts don't tell her that her youngest daughters are hurting their chances? That, that they are garnering in the broader population the kind of reaction that Darcy has to them? Why doesn't she see that? I admit, her own manners are terrible, but she is that one and only goal. I've never really, I've never really got that. Uh, anxiety on Jane's behalf was another prevailing concern, and Mr. Darcy's explanation by restoring Bingley to all his her former good opinion, heightened the sense of what Jane has lost. Darcy's explanation was that he that he didn't know that Jane returned Bingley's feelings, which says what? That Bingley's feelings are genuine, that they were completely genuine. That everything about that was right. He was not trifling with Jane. Uh, his affection was proved to have been sincere, and his conduct cleared of all blame, unless any could attach to the implicitness of his confidence in his friend. How grievous, then, was the thought that, of a situation so desirable in every respect, so replete with advantage, so promising of happiness, Jane had been deprived by the folly in, and indecorum of her own family. I know, I'm not going to get in the way of Elizabeth castigating herself here, but she was also deprived of that by Darcy. Bingley would have gone back. On his own, he would have gone back. So in a very real sense, he was deprived, Jane was deprived of her happiness with Bingley by Darcy and Bingley's sisters. <laughs> uh, but we'll let it go here because we don't, we don't interrupt the flow of rebuke. Uh, when to these recollections was added the development of Wickham's character, it may be easily believed that the happy spirits, which had seldom been depressed before, were now so much affected as to make it almost impossible for her to appear tolerably cheerful. Their engagement at Rosings was as, were as frequent during the last week of her stay as they had been at first. The very last evening was spent there, and her ladyship again inquired minutely into the particulars of their journey, gave them directions as to the best method of packing, and was so urgent on the necessity of placing gowns in the only right way that Maria thought herself obliged on her return to undo all the work of the morning and pack her trunk afresh. <laughs> when they parted, Lady Catherine, with great condescension, wished them a good journey, and invited them to come to Hunsford again next year. And Mr. Berg exerted herself so far as to curtsy and hold out her hand to both. We scarcely heard a, a single word from Catherine de Berg, from the little, little, little de Berg girl. Uh, but there you go. That is chapter 37. Necessarily anticlimactic. Uh, because of all the, the heady stuff that we've been having. Elizabeth can barely make herself feel, appear cheerful, and all she can think about is that letter, and how it interrupts her whole world. But as far as she's concerned, it's a dead subject. Jane is still in London. She and Bingley might meet. I, that part is up in the air and is not particularly well nailed down, I think, uh, by Jane Austen. But she and Darcy? No hope at all there. She has refused him and he has said, I take your refusal. I won't waste your time. I don't want to disgust you. I just feel that my honor needs me to explain myself. And that will be the end of it. Uh, Darcy has given her the impression that Bingley means to quit Netherfield Hall entirely. So Darcy will never be back. To the, to the neighborhood of Meryton. The only possibility for that plot to thicken anymore would be if she went into his neighborhood. <laughs> I 
So well, that's our chapter for today, uh, and we'll wrap this up. We'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.